Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. We are from group number 3 and we were assigned to present this topic periodontal versus oral mucosa problems. Our members are Nadira, Shifa, Kwatudina, Fariha, Aina and Hana. Here is a case study regarding periodontal disease. A 48-year-old male patient was referred by a general practitioner to the Institute for Periodontology and School of Dentistry, Kyungpo National University. He had several issues in the past with red and bleeding gingival tissue. Over the last few months, he noticed that his teeth seemed to be getting longer as well as being loose. One morning, he bites into a soft nothing and two of his teeth actually fall out. So here we can notice that his gingiva are bleeding and also red and with his teeth seem to be getting longer and also loose and also two of his teeth casually fall out when he ate his, his muffin. So from this picture, we can see that there is a bleeding gingiva tissue with and swollen gingiva, gum recession, exposed root, tooth is quite mobile, and also there is a tooth loss. These are the clinical features that can be seen. Gum disease is mainly caused by plaque and poor dental hygiene. Plaque is a sticky film of saliva, food and germs that accumulates on teeth or put above and below the gum lines which gives risk for gingivitis. When plaque stays put, it hardens into tartar, which is also known as calculus, and both dental plaque and tartar are filled with harmful bacteria, and if they aren't removed, they will begin to irritate the gums and cause gingivitis. Gingivitis is the first stage of gum disease. If plaque and tartar are not cleaned away and gingivitis is left untreated, it may lead to inflammation and destruction of tissues surrounding and supporting teeth, gums, bones and fibers that hold the gums to the teeth, causing the more severe form of gum disease called periodontitis. Teeth may become loose and need to be removed because gum disease is often painless and you may not know you have a problem until you have some serious damage. So the etiology of this patient's disease is poor oral hygiene which lead to blood accumulation and after that cockles will be formed and the cockles will cause inflammation of the gum which is called gingivitis and gingivitis will lead to periodontitis if left untreated. As for the diagnosis, what we can do are dental panoramic x-ray, probing of gum tissue, identify order health of past or present, genetic testing, the DNA, PCR, or saliva. And for the prevention and treatment, brushing two times daily, flossing daily, early diagnosis, antimicrobial mouth prints, flap surgery, wound and tissue graft, and also dentures. For oral mucosa disease case study, a rare case of oral and esophageal malignancy after allogenic HSCT, an immunohistochemical analysis of P16 in malignant pre-malignant and non-malignant lesion was performed. It is to observe whether the P16 would be the indicator for HPV also. For the clinical history, a 35-year-old male was diagnosed with malignant lymphoma of the small intestine and was treated with surgery and chemoradiotherapy. He also had a complete response after peripheral blood stem cell transplantation, PBSCT. Eight years after the PBSCT, he was diagnosed with treatment-related acute myeloid leukemia and underwent allogenic HSCT stem cell. A month after the HSCT, he developed interstitial pneumonia due to acute GVHT. He had lignoid lesion in the oral mucosa also. Two years after the HSCT, he presented with an erosive mass in the upper gingiva and adherent white patches in the lower gingiva. We could see in the clinical finding when A. There's an erosive mass in the upper gingiva, B, white patches in the lower gingiva, C, lesion and stain with lugal solution in the esophagus, and D, could see the partial mesilectomy. For the pathological finding, A and B, there's a kentosis, C and D, oral epithelial dysplasia, E and F, the oral squamous cell carcinoma. So for the discussion and conclusion, 
skin and mucosal neoplasm account for approximately one-third all secondary solid tumor in HSCT patients, with oral squamous cell carcinoma representing 50% of these cases. P16 overexpression was not a reliable predictor of HPV infection in young patients with tongue SCC, although remarkable correlation between HPV detection and P16 overexpression in oral pharyngeal carcinoma has been reported. In this case, P16 overexpression was detected only in malignant and premalignant lesion but not keratotic lesion. Pathological examination with P16 immunohistochemistry may contribute to early diagnosis of oral and esophageal malignancy in immunocompromised patient after HSCT. Now, let's move on to the differences between periodontal versus oral mucosal problems. First of all, based on the etiology, periodontal problems are caused by accumulation of dental biofilm, primarily in healthy individuals, and systemic diseases in some cases, whereas for oral mucosal problems, they are caused by local causes such as bacterial, viral, systemic diseases like metabolic and immunologic, drug-related reactions, and lifestyle factors such as the usage of tobacco and alcohol. Next, based on the methods of oral diagnosis, periodontal problems require clinicians to look for the swollen gingiva probing on each sulcus to see how deep it is and take radiograph to evaluate bone level. As for the oral mucosal problems, it requires history taking, inspection, oral examination such as palpitation, percussion, aspiration and auscultation, radiograph examination and lab examination. So this table shows the differences between periodontal problems and also oral mucosal problems. For periodontal problems, the chief complaints may include redness, swelling, bleeding, and also tooth loss for severe periodontitis. But it may also appear asymptomatic for some people. While for oral mucosal problems, the chief complaints may include pain, soreness, bleeding, loose teeth, and also dry mouth. For the onset and causes for periodontal problems, it may start with a normal and a healthy periodontium. However, if this periodontium have a lot of unremoved plaque, and it can lead to gingivitis where there's no attachment loss and this problem is still reversible. If this problem is left untreated, it may progress to early attachment loss, which is up to 25%, and then progress to a moderate attachment loss, which is about 25-50%. to 50%. And in severe cases, this problem can lead to a severe attachment loss, which is about over 50%. And these problems will become irreversible and may include bone loss. For the onset and causes for oral mucosal problems, it may start with a massive increase in size just before eating. And this problem may progress to a slow-growing masses in which the duration is about months to years. And if this problem is left untreated, it can progress to a moderately rapid growing masses and it only takes about two months. And it can progress to a rapidly growing masses in which it takes about hours to days. And the last onset and causes for oral mucosal problems is a masses with accompanying fever. The fifth point to differentiate between periodontal and oral mucosal problems is by its color. For periodontal problems, the normal color is pinkish and when it is inflamed, it becomes reddish. Move on to oral mucosal problems. The normal color is also pinkish, but when it is infected, it changes into several different colors, where it can be whitish when there is epithelial hyperplasia, hyperkeratosis, or dense collagen bundle, reddish for atrophy epithelium, blackish for nervous tattoo or melanosis, yellowish for adipose tissue or glands, and lastly, it becomes translucent blue for the liquid reflection. Lastly, it is to differentiate by its treatment. For periodontal problems, the treatment is very depends on its severity. If it is mild, patient can just practice daily brushing, flossing, 
and usage of antimicrobial agents such as mouthwash to prevent the dental plaque accumulation. Also, patients can seek for a dental treatment called scaling. But in severe cases, patients might need antibiotic or a surgery. Meanwhile, for oral mucosa problem, the treatment is depend on what type of disease it is rather than the severity. Either antifungal or antiviral agent can be given to patients. And sometimes conservative surgical excision have to be performed in some cases. Last but not least, there is also typical steroid usage in some cases like erosive Lincoln planus. So, that's all for the differences between periodontal problem and oral mucosal problem. For the next part of this presentation, we will discuss deeper about the periodontal problems and oral mucosal problems. The first part is periodontal disease. Periodontal disease can be classified into two, gingivitis and periodontitis. Gingivitis now has been subcategorized into two, dental plaque-induced gingival disease and non-plaque-induced gingival disease. Periodontitis has been subdivided into three categories, chronic periodontitis, aggressive periodontitis, and periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic disease. For the etiology of periodontal disease, both gingivitis and periodontitis have the same etiology which is the dental biofilm. Dental biofilm, also known as PAC, it can be defined as a soft adherent structure deposit that accumulates on teeth or other hair surfaces in the mouth. It also consists of continuous growing microbial colonies within the food system. Next, we're going to talk about the dental biofilm formation. How the dental biofilm forms? First, there will be an acquired pellicle formation followed by adherence of salivary glycoprotein onto the surface. Next, there will be a rapid colonization by pioneer species, which usually consists of gram positive rod or cocci. And lastly, there will be other bacteria that can adhere to the pellicle by specificity, such as Streptococcus sanguis, Streptococcus oralis, Streptococcus mitis, and also Actinomyces viscosus. Next is the definition of periodontal disease. As we can see from the picture below, gingivitis can progress to periodontitis. With gingivitis, gingi refers to the gum, and itis refers to inflammation. So, gingivitis is the inflammation of the gum. With periodontitis, peri means around, odon refers to the teeth, and itis refers to the inflammation. So, periodontitis is inflammation and destruction of structures around the teeth. Gingivitis is the reversible oral disease that refers to gingival inflammation induced by bacterial biofilm. When left untreated, they progress to periodontitis. Gums are swollen and bleed easily even with gentle brushing. They may also be caused by tobacco smoking, mild occlusion, as well as vitamin C deficiency. Hormonal changes during puberty, menopause, and also pregnancy can cause sensitive gingiva that is vulnerable to inflammation. Cancer, diabetes, HIV, and family history also increase risk of developing gingivitis. Now, let's discuss about the periodontitis. Periodontitis can be defined as an inflammation around the tooth that progress from an untreated gingivitis. It is also known as a gum disease, where it is a common infection that damages the soft tissue and bone supporting structure of the tooth. Periodontitis can happen when there is a bacteria and a plaque buildup around the tooth and our immune system launch a reaction. Periodontitis can be prevented and treated by having a good oral hygiene at the early stage. But sometimes, if it is severe, surgery may be necessary. And there is also studies showing that smoking can increase the risk of gum disease and cause the treatment for not working. Lastly, this gum disease may increase the risk of systemic diseases such as stroke. 
Okay, now let's watch a simple video regarding periodontal disease. If dental plaque above the gingiva keeps building, the bacteria within that biofilm can invade beneath the gingiva, where it becomes really difficult to reach with brushing. Eventually, it can form a hard mass called a dental calculus. Dental calculus creates a nice space for bacterial plaque formation because it's hard to remove. And from there, bacteria can enter the gingival sulcus and cause gingival inflammation or gingivitis. Damaged gingival cells release inflammatory signals that recruit neutrophils to the area. And those neutrophils can release harmful chemicals that kill bacteria, as well as damage the nearby tissue. Fortunately, simple gingivitis is a reversible condition and the damaged tissue can heal over time as long as the infection is stopped and treated. In periodontitis, the process of dysbiosis is often more extreme, with even more disease-causing bacteria flourishing in the mouth. One classic hypothesis suggests that the first step in periodontitis is the presence of the so-called orange complex of bacteria, which includes gram-negative anaerobic bacteria like Fusobacterium nucleatum and Prevotella intermedia. Once these orange complex bacteria are established, the next step is the presence of the so-called red complex of bacteria, which includes Tanarella forsythia, Treponema denticola, and its most notorious member, Porphyromonas gingivalis, or P. gingivalis for short. Another line of thinking suggests that rather than these red complex bacteria being the specific culprits, it's the overall change in the bacterial community that these bacteria trigger that tips the scale toward periodontitis. Either way, the pathogenic bacteria within the subgingival dental plaque create a periodontal pocket and damage gingival cells in the process. Local mast cells and nerves release chemicals like histamine and substance P, which cause dilation of local blood vessels, resulting in swelling of the gingiva. Damaged gingival cells release additional cytokines like interleukin-1, which brings more immune cells to the area, like neutrophils and macrophages. The body's immune response causes even more damage to the gingiva and periodontal ligament, ultimately loosening the tooth. That one notorious bacteria, P. gingivalis, is also known for impairing immune cells from effectively killing bacteria. This helps other pathogenic bacteria to overgrow as well, kind of like a thief that destroys the police station and allows other thieves to flourish in a city. The immune response also delivers more blood flow to the damaged tissue, which provides more nutrients for the bacteria. Together, the bacteria and immune response end up in a positive feedback loop where the expanding infection causes an increased immune response, which doesn't destroy the bacteria but provides the bacteria with more fuel to grow. The immune response also activates osteoclasts in the bone, which start to dissolve the bone supporting the tooth, loosening it even more. Symptoms of gingivitis typically include redness, swelling, and bleeding, especially after brushing or flossing. Some people, though, experience no symptoms, especially in the early stages of infection. Severe disease that progresses the periodontitis can result in tooth loss. Diagnosis of gingivitis and periodontitis are usually made by looking for swollen or bleeding gums, as well as probing of each gingival sulcus to determine how deep it is, and x-rays to evaluate the bone level. With inflammation and destruction, the sulcus becomes deeper as the periodontal pocket expands. Treatment depends on how severe the infection is. Daily brushing and flossing, and use of antimicrobial agents like mouthwashes, can help prevent the formation of dental plaque. But in severe cases, antibiotics and surgery might be needed. Alright, as a quick recap. Gingivitis is caused by infection and inflammation of the gingiva, that can grow to involve the tooth-supporting structures, which is called periodontitis. When dental plaque builds up near the gum line, it can allow bacteria to invade toward the root of the tooth. Diagnosis is done via visual inspection, x-rays, and probing the gums. And treatment of severe cases might include removal of the infected tissue, antibiotics, and surgery. Now, Let's move on to the oral mucosa problems, which is the second part of this presentation. The oral mucosa is the mucous membrane lining the inside of the mouth. 
It comprises stratified squamous epithelium term, oral epithelium, and an underlying connective tissue term, lamina propria. The oral cavity has sometimes been described as a mirror that reflects the health of the individual. Changes indicative of disease are seen as alterations in the oral mucosa lining the mouth, which can reveal systemic conditions such as diabetes or vitamin deficiency, or the local effects of chronic tobacco and or alcohol use. The oral mucosa tends to heal faster and with less scar formation compared to the skin. The underlying mechanism remains unknown, but research suggests that extracellular vesicles may be involved. The infections of oral mucosa comprises of several aspects. First of all, let's start with the bacterial infections. Actinomycosis may reveal conditions such as submandibular swelling and chronic separation with multiple sinuses. Next, syphilis may reveal conditions such as snail tract ulcers and mucus patches. Tuberculosis may reveal painless chronic lingual ulcer and enlarged regional lymph nodes. And leprosy may show nodular masses on palate and anterior maxilla. Moving on to the next aspect, which is the viral infection. Viral infection caused by piconoviruses such as Coxsackie A are associated with herpangina, where oropharyngitis results in oral vesicle which breaks down into small ulcers. Viral infection caused by herpes virus such as herpes simplex or HSV type 1 may reveal conditions such as tiny ulcers during the primary stage and may cause pharyngitis, tonsillitis or hepatic gingival stomatitis. Some patients may experience gingivitis, which can be erythematous and edematous. Chickenpox and herpes zoster may reveal small oral mucosal ulcers, whereas cytomegalovirus has little evidence of cause and effect other than the presence of infected cells, and Epstein Barr virus may cause inflammation and ulceration of oral mucosal at junction of heart and soft palates. Other than that, viral infection caused by papilloma virus may associate it with oral cancer, particularly nasopharyngeal carcinomas and salivary gland tumors. Moreover, hairy leukoplakia and pseudomembranous candidiasis are most frequent oral manifestations of human immunodeficiency virus. Last but not least, Fungal infections may cause candidiasis that has three clinical forms that occur most frequently, which are pseudomembranous starch, erythematous, and hyperplastic. Let's moving on to non-infectious diseases of oral mucosa. There are five types of non-infectious diseases of oral mucosa, and the first one is a recurrent aftosomatitis, which further classified into majoras, minoras, and also herpetiform. The most common among all these is um, minoras. However, uh, the largest one is uh, the majoras because the size is more than 1 cm in size. Uh, this lesion may occur due to predisposing factors such as oil trauma, stress, and also certain foods. The second one is uh, dermatosis, which is a disease of the integumentary system and includes everything on the surface of the body. Diseases that classified under dermatosis, including uh, erythema multiform, pemphigus, mucous membrane pemphigoid, and also epidermolysis bullosa acquisita. And these diseases occur due to hypersensitivity to drugs, viruses, genetic association, and also autoimmune diseases. The common sites for, uh, for dermatosis is bacal mucosa and also followed by palates, lips, tongue, and also labial mucosa, which is about 16% in commonness. The third one is Jorgen syndrome, which defined as a chronic inflammatory autoimmune disease, that affects especially the older woman and is characterized by dryness of mucous membrane, especially of the eyes and mouth. And it has two classifications, which is primary and secondary Sjogren syndrome. The primary often occurs in the absence of another underlying rheumatic disorder, whereas secondary is associated with another underlying rheumatic disease such as SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, and also scleroderma. The next disease is lichen planus that affects mucous membrane inside our mouth and it may appear as a white, lacy patches, red swollen tissue or open sores and may cause burning, pain or other discomfort. And the last one for non-infectious disease of oral mucosa is tumor 
or known as oral cancer. And the most common cause for uh, tumor or this oral cancer is tobacco and also excessive consumption of alcohol. That is all from us. We hope that our presentation was clear and could help the students to understand about this topic better. Thank you for listening.